Thank you, Father. Jesus extols, lifts up the woman who cried and wept at his feet and, and wiped the tears from his, from his feet with her hair. Even while the people who were sitting around him said, don't you know what manner of a woman touches you? When he asked the question, who loves more? One who has been forgiven little or one who's been forgiven much? And rightly said, he says, well, I suppose the one who was forgiven much loves more. And the question often is, how much have we been forgiven? In reality, from a theological and a philosophical standpoint, we can all say that we're all sinners, we're all deserving of death and hell. But in practicality, we rarely feel that way. We tend to excuse ourselves. And we're not nearly so hard on ourselves as we ought to be. Charles Spurgeon said this, the church of God is never so well built up as when it is built up with men of broken hearts. I have prayed to God in secret many a time of late that he would be pleased to gather out from among us a people who have a deep experience, who should know the guilt of sin, who should be broken and ground to powder under a sense of their own inability and unworthiness. He who has never been in the dungeon, who has never been in the abyss, who has never felt as if he were cast out from the sight of God, how can he comfort many who are outcast and who are bound with the fetters of despair? George Whitfield, the great preacher of the Great Awakening, he was talking about the publican and the Pharisee who were praying before the Lord. And uh, Jesus pointed out that the Pharisee stood and he prayed a great prayer for everybody to hear. And the contrast between that and the publican. This is what George Whitfield said about the publican. Poor heart. What did he feel at this time? None but returning publicans like him can tell. I see him standing afar off, pensive, oppressed, and even overwhelmed with sorrow. Sometimes he attempts to look up, but then he thinks, how shall such a wretch as I dare to lift up my guilty head? And to show that his heart was full of holy self-resentment and that he sorrowed after a godly sort, he smites upon his breast, his treacherous, ungrateful, desperately wicked breast, a breast now ready to burst and at length out of the abundance of his heart, I doubt not, with many tears, he at last cries out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner, a sinner by birth, a sinner in thought, word, and deed, a sinner as to my person, a sinner as to all my performances, a sinner in whom is no health, in whom no dwelleth no good thing, a sinner, poor, miserable, blind, and naked, from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet, full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, a self-accused, self-condemned sinner. I tell you, says our Lord, this man, this publican, this despised, sinful, but broken-hearted man went down to his house justified, acquitted and looked upon as righteous in the sight of God rather than the other. The other man, the Pharisee, and the way that he spoke, it seemed that he came with the attitude that the Lord was fortunate to have such a follower as himself. Far be it from us to have that attitude. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I know very little about the poverty of spirit, sorrow over sin, and true repentance. Please, please bring me, bring all of us 
to that place of self-nothingness. I'm fed up with self-based religion. I want to be like this publican. Please bring me to an end of myself, no matter what the cost. I will not let go of you until I receive all that I need in you. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray for a broken heart. Amen. God's mercy is infinite. Is it not? Is it not that he, guys, that he, uh, we don't deserve what he gives. Not even a fingernail. And I confess for myself that I, I think I shared before um, when I got into more messianic sort of thought, belief. I built up a pride, a religion, um, and the Lord showed me recently, as I'm slowly going through um, Thomas Akempis, the imitation of Christ. Oh God, when you showed me, when you brought me through the second crisis back in 2019, when I read Helen Ewan and saw. Uh, and I just, I was undone. I, I would, I couldn't stop weeping for a week. And he, it's been an amazing journey where, very much like Job, I, I've heard of you, I've known you, I've been with you, but now I've seen you face to face, and I repent in dust and ashes. And uh, the Lord showed me, I had stopped weeping. Since I've come to Christ in 2003, I'd be so full of joy and, and just loving Jesus. Religion, not that it was built up from nothing, but there was a hidden evil in my heart that God had to bring it from me. And, um, and then he broke me and said, yeah, yes, David, you're the man. Nathan shaking his bony finger, you're the man. And saying, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <sighs> One of the signs, and, 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 and if you haven't read this book, The Diary of David Brainerd, John Wesley said, make sure every one of these new preachers gets a copy of that book. You see the faithfulness of God. David Brainerd has been in toil, in labor, in exposure to snow, he, he ministered to the Delaware Indians, coughing up blood, died of tuberculosis at the age of 29. Spurred on many, many people who are now home. Leonard Ravenhill, David Wilkerson, William Carey, countless others. Oh, that I may lay in the dust at the feet of infinite majesty, he would say. Suffered depression, isolation. But God help me a little, he would say, day after day after day. And you see the faithfulness of God because of the wretchedness of us. And how he pours his life to us. Because we were willing to be open and broken. <clears throat> Father, this message is uncomfortable. But yet, you teach us that if we don't love your appearing then we are not willing to receive you. Then we are not able. Oh God, may we love your appearing. Then you would show yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Huh, that was sort of neat. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, God gave me this word, are you ready for the coming of Jesus? And uh, I, I admit, it, it will sound a little bit like David Wilkerson's message, are you ready for the coming of Jesus? Not because, it's, it's because the text, and God, he works in cycles and he brings messages. Um, so this is not a reproduction, but this is a reiteration. Um Go to Matthew 24, 
verse 45. Um, 45. Thank you, honey, for sharing that powerful message. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? That slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. I assure you he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked slave says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drink with the drunkards, that slave's master will come on a day he does not expect and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces or in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so uh, I, I pray um, those who hear these messages that we are constantly challenging each other to live sacrificially. Leonard Ravenhill would say, the cardinal ethic of a Christian is sacrifice, not success. Sacrifice. There are people suffering for their faith. No food, no clothes. We're the privileged ones. We are really the privileged ones. I came across uh, an article that said of North Korea, the church is growing so fast in that country. They don't care about lack of food. They don't care about lack of clothes. Their big hearts cry. They want more Bibles. They want more gospel material. They want more resources to preach Jesus. That's what they want. And it's happening. They're getting it. They don't care about their earthly needs. And uh, really highlighted about the um, the recent election where I think it's been a plight of a lot of the Christians and, and I'm not going on a soapbox, but it's it's trying to trying to show the Lord showed me uh, gave me a dream years ago where I was in this mansion, this safety, and I look out and there's destruction all over the place. It reminds me of anybody who's seen the movie with Charlton Heston, The Ten Commandments, where all, they're all dancing around the golden calf and you know, committing who knows what. And, um, but Moses is on the mountain. Joshua is as close as possible. And um, they're in that hidden place, that hiding place, that safe place. Psalm 91, Lord, you are my refuge. Cover me with the shadow of your wings. And I look in my dream. I look out and I see this destruction. And then I look back. I said, well, I guess it's not time to go out yet. And with the recent election, I admit my failure. That's what I was focusing too much on earthly things. Got caught up with it thinking, oh, great. God's come. Assuming, transposing God's coming. It was a lesson. The Lord is so gracious to teach. The Lord was was reminding me that rulers will come and go. Famines, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars, they're going to come and go. Our job is Jesus. Our labor is Jesus. Our reflection is Jesus. And when you are in that, it, hell can literally occur on earth. Thermonuclear warfare can happen on this earth. We of all people should not be moved. Our lives here are a dressing room. In a dressing room, it's usually right before the actual stage. We usually look in the mirror prior to the performance because there are no do-overs. 
Eternity's our stage. Jesus is our mirror, and there are no do-overs. The Father's the director that's sitting in that crowd. His garments and praise are the costume we wear. They are those garments of righteousness. So the text on my master's delayed is coming. Guys, I'm, I fear and tremble, and I pray that anything that is heard that you guys are challenged in your faith to spur this on to, you know, share these words to good, to, to, to encourage others to further holiness, to further sacrificial living for Jesus. So the phrase, my master's delay is coming. Lord, what did that mean? I asked. We don't say, and, and he says it in his heart very clearly. He says it in his heart. Okay, two things. Slave. Paul says, I am a doulos in the Greek. I'm a bond slave. If we are crucified with Christ, you get on that cross, you lose rights. You give permission to the world to hurl every sort of insult, physical matter, and mockery at you. And say, okay. I submit because this is God's will. That's what I, I trust Jesus. This is for, that's what Jesus is. This is for the, for, for the love of uh, set before him. Knowing that it'll bring resurrection life. Knowing that it's only temporary for the resurrection. That's what a slave says. I have no rights. It's not mine. It's not my own. Paul says, why not be defrauded? In 1 Corinthians, when dealing with believers having quarrels, why not suffer wrong? You know what? I'd rather maintain the unity of, of Jesus communion then claim my rights that you owe me something no I, I, I don't want to even do that okay so that slave give you an understanding as to what a slave is wicked in terms of the scripture you look all throughout the Psalms wicked men are before me they do what are they heathens are they Ammonites are they Moabites no wicked men they swear falsely by your name not by Baal not by Chemosh not by Asherah by Yahweh. They swear falsely by Yahweh. They're Christian in name only. Now, it's not our place to judge. I'm not saying that. But they're the ones that take the name of God, of Jesus, upon their lips. But they don't do what he says. They don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's a somebody who say they've lost their rights, but with a false oath. Okay? It's like looking at the dressing room mirror. Remember, the, the thought is we're in a dressing room right before the stage. Finding the hat we're wearing is either a wrong hat or not put on right and saying, Father, Jesus, I just, this is very important and I just pray that we receive this with sobriety. Oh, that's no big deal. Change that phrase to my master delayed is coming to. Oh, it's not a big deal. God will understand. Oh, God's okay. Or he's not going to be too concerned. When have you said those words? Oh, not a big deal. Oh, it's okay. Ah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to it. Really? In the assemblies uh, denomination, they have part of their denominational creed living in the imminent return of Jesus Christ it is in there in the scripture do you know Jesus can come right now for you I've heard Francis Chan tell a story about a person he's at a funeral for a, 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 a believer a pastor the person gives the eulogy makes a statement saying be certain and know that your sins will find you out. Jesus is coming. Get ready. Goes to sit down. <laughs> dies right there. They had two funerals right there. The guy went to be with the Lord right there. How do you know you that you're not going to take your last I may be taking my last breath right now. I won't. I'll be in glory. What are you going to do? My master's like, not a big deal. Oh, it's okay. Oh, uh, God is saying, son, clean up your room. Listen to mommy and daddy. 
you know, you really should be doing devotions. You know, your schoolwork is very important. Are you sure you're doing your best handwriting? What about your best work? Are you spray coding that really well? How about that word you said to your wife? Oh, it's it's no big no big deal. I didn't I didn't Ah she get over it. What? She get over it? Do you understand that you are before the judgment seat of Christ right now? If you can't get ready for the judgment seat of Christ then, now at this moment you will not be ready. And you show by your actions you do not love the appearing of Jesus. Because that director is out there. You get on the stage, all the crowd may say, oh wow, how wonderful. The director said, he didn't do what I cast him to do. That's not what I told him to do. And, the, and just wait. And the director will say, you did not do what I told you to do. God forbid we say anything like that. No one's going to care. God cares because he's the director watching it unfold. And he's gracious enough, this is the beauty, to stop us backstage before the performance to correct it. Do you realize how generous? Every time he pokes you, don't say that. Stop. Go back. Make it right. That's backstage right before the performance. We are watched. Behold, we are surrounded before a great crowd of witnesses. Hebrews 4.13 for every creature is naked and exposed before him who we must all give an account. You're exposed. Let's face it. Guys, you're naked. Okay? You are naked before him. He sees through your clothes. He sees through phoniness. He sees through your pride. He sees it. He says, stop coming to me with your lips. I want your heart broken. I'm tired of it. I'll give you your little worship service. Guys, I don't like preaching like this. He says, I'll give you what you want. Not for long. Because when I come and you refuse to turn, you'll be broken beyond healing. That's Proverbs. He who stiffens his neck to reproof will suddenly be broken beyond healing. Folks, we're in a dressing room. Eating and drinking with the drunk. Why are we having a party backstage with those who care nothing of the performance? This is an outward sign of ceasing to obey. Eating and drinking with the drunk, beating the fellow servants. That means you care about the things here. You're concerned about politics. Concerned about, are we going to have food? There's a now, granted, the prudent sees danger and hides himself. Yes, I understand that. Where God says, look, there's a storm coming. It, it's going to affect you. Yes, okay. As a commander, you, you do that for your soldiers. You do that for your children. Look, it's we got five minutes. We got to get on the bus, okay? I'm not neglecting that. Guys, it is not worth it. It is not worth it. Be prepared for eternity. Be prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. Be prepared for his personal appearing. Because when you see him, when you see him, you're not, you're not going to stand. You will weep and see the glory. Hair white as snow, eyes full of fire, pierce you to the bone, to, to, to the very core of who you are. And unless, now he knows, he, he can say, I mean, you can be totally broken and fine. He knows what you, to what level you're at. I'm not trying to beat up, but by the same token, because he knows us, he knows our frame. He knows we're dust, but by the same token, it's like the little kid say, Daddy, I know with, you know, auto mechanics. And you're like, the kid's five. You know, the kid is just playing. But they're those saying, no, watch me. I'm going to go change the oil. You better be careful. No. And they start wrenching the tools from you. Okay. You're going to get hurt. And then they get hurt. Um, 
brother shared a message from Joe Sweet out in uh, California. He said, "Lord, I want to see hell." I didn't want to. I don't want to ask that prayer. I, I've I've heard of so many testimonies about hell, and I said, "Lord, I I know about all of this." But then immediately, because I said I know about all of this, I was convicted of my pride. Okay, I got alone with God. Lord, I don't want to see it, but I do. I need a fresh boldness for what you're doing. Now, folks, guys, the following, and I said I was challenged, and I, I challenged my, my brother, brother in Christ, who I love dearly. Um, I said, I, I asked the Lord, please show me hell so that I may have a fresh fervency in preaching, in sharing, in love, in concern, in anguish. And he said, I asked the same thing. Guys, I was driving to 50 Lakes, and then on my way back, guys, I heard screaming. I heard screaming. I heard screaming. A, you know, sometimes you've gone to a, an ocean, you hear the ocean's roar. Scriptures, you'll hear the oceans roar like a ball game. Or you know, it was a sea full of screams, agony, screaming, blood curdling, like somebody having their guts ripped open, no anesthesia, and they're wide awake, slowly, with a, like with a spoon. Okay, screams. I heard a testimony, God brought me a testimony of a man who is a Buddhist monk, now goes by the name of Paul, died. He, he had malaria and yellow fever at the same time. They left him for dead. They had no hope for him. In their religion, they have no concept of hell. It's, it, he, he had no idea, never been exposed to Christianity. Guy over in Myanmar, he sees this lake of fire. He says, what is this? And there's a Satan figure, Apollyon, destroyer goes to him and, and he says that he this is Satan and he says who is that man and the man was the Buddhist monk's mentor as he was growing in his religion but he was a good person he said he did not believe in the Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ the Savior of the world and then he sees this person and I could, I could see his face right now with hair like about one inch braids sort of going down to the left immediately I said that's Siddhartha Gautama that's the Buddha I don't know that I never saw I mean there, there are no pictures of him and immediately the next set Paul says who is this man this is Buddha who you worship and I said Lord how do I know that and he told me very quietly I'm showing you hell If you are a slave of Jesus Christ, he owns you. It's not your it's not your own, it's not your will. You if you love really love him, you would want to be with him all the time in his presence. And he says, No, I got work for you here. Tell others about me. Because the love of God constrains us, we persuade men. How much is your love for him? How much have you been forgiven by him? Or you've been forgiven by him a lot. How much do you see your forgiveness? We were that woman. That wretched woman. We were that adulteress. We were that proud Pharisee who thinks, Oh, look how great I am. I'm a great Christian. Lord, I've done all this for you. You haven't done squat. You want to do something for the Lord? Get on your face and say, Jesus, like the Puritans did. Show me the weight of my sin. I don't hate my sin. I want to hate it. Every time you run to that little TV show, that Fox commentary, make you feel better, that prophecy word, prophecy channel, such and such Christian leader messed up and said that phrase and now has to apologize for preaching against homosexuality or whatever. Every time you go and see, they're not doing it right. Bull stink. You're not doing it right. Your heart's not right. My heart's not right. I got to stand before a holy God. I don't take care of my kids right. Mm -hmm. 
I don't love them right. I don't serve them right. I'm, I'm guilty. I don't respond rightly. Guys, we don't deny ourselves enough. Every small bit of inconvenience, that's an opportunity for the glory of God to shine. So when you're inconvenienced, and, and, and at that moment, like, oh God, I don't want to have to deal with this. And God says, I want you to deal with it. That's him saying, I want you to deal with this. I want you to deal with this. And to say, okay, Lord, I don't want to deal with it. Rather, my flesh doesn't. I'm sorry. That's where you say, I'm sorry. I will submit. I'll do what you ask. We don't like inconvenience. Or shall we say the flesh doesn't? And I want to read something from Kemp, Thomas Kempis. Eating and drinking with the drunk, beating the fellow servants are the believers who are trying to obey and the wicked servant repeatedly puts down, hinders the other servant, either through criticism, through hands, through thought, through anything. Thank you. Guys, they're not doing it right. That's none of your business. You do as the Lord guides you. If he tells you, go talk to XYZ person because they're listening to heresy, fine. You worry about yourself. You get right with God. You just stay in that place. You don't need to figure it out. Like a, like a maiden to her mistress. Yes, ma'am. I love uh, the book by C.S. Lewis. The Horse and His Boy. The Calamine girl yeah cower mean she would say to hear is to obey and that's correct um first thessalonians 4 minding your own affairs doing work with your own hands that you may have to give spur one another on to good works spur one another into holiness holiness is defined by how close do you look like Jesus? That's holiness. That's the definition of, definition of holiness. Not how much you pray, not how much you fast, not how much you read the word. No. How much you look like Jesus? Do you look like Jesus? I can't answer that. But these are words that God is giving. Um, go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 11. Uh, go to verse... Nine, um, section B, the, the second half of the verse. Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes. This is a warning from the Lord. But know for all of these things, God will bring you into judgment. Go to chapter 12, second half of verse 13 into 14. I'll just read 13. When all, okay, 12. But beyond these, my son, be warned, there's no end to the making of many books, and much study wearies the body. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, is this fear God, keep his commandments, because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Guys, if God were to come here right now, are you ready for him to say, okay, let's let's take a record, see what you're doing? Are you ready for that? Guys, ask the Lord, Are you? am I ready to be exposed, right? If he was to say, okay, audit time, let's see what you did over your life and over the past day, past week. Are you ready? Are you ready for him to do that? And if he finds something, our lives should always be audited before that mirror of God and his word. Let him, let him read you. If you are always living in that presence that I'm before the almighty throne judgment, and I know I can't, I love Jesus and I do what he tells me. Folks, if he says, son, you didn't do this right, oh, you are ready to say, I'm sorry, I messed up. And he's ready to pour grace and forgiveness. 
Because the blood of Jesus covers us. And you say, I plead the blood of Jesus because I can't do it. I, I, I'm sorry, Lord, I messed up. And he says, yeah, I know. But I'm showing you how to do it better. I'm chastising you as a son, not punishing you as a wicked, as a wicked one. As a wicked one. Let's take a look real quick. I'm just going to read this from Thomas Akempis. Uh, book 3, chapter 54. The different uh, motions of nature and grace. He says this. This is the voice of Christ. It's sort of like a dialogue like Jesus calling. My child, pay careful attention to the movements of nature and of grace. For they move in very contrary and subtle ways. And Jesus, I so thank you for the opportunity to deliver your word. Jesus, you're so good. I bless your name. And I thank you. You are worthy to be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Be careful to nature and of grace. They move in very contrary and subtle ways. And can scarcely be distinguished by anyone except a man who is spiritual and inwardly enlightened. All men indeed desire what is good and strive for what is good in their words and deeds. For this reason, the appearance of good deceives many. Guys, that's like the Viet Cong. There is good flesh. It's a thing called good flesh. Looks good. God says, it's still flesh. I hate it. You want to know what I think about the flesh? Go to Matthew 27 and 26 and see what I did to the flesh. That's what I, I hate it. Nature is crafty and attracts many, ensnaring and deceiving them while see, ever seeking itself. Grace walks in simplicity, turns away from all appearance of evil, offers no deceits, and does all purely for God in whom she rests at, as her last end. Y'all ready to hear the next thing? Nature is not willing to die or to be kept down to, or to be overcome, nor will it subdue itself or be made subject. We don't like that. Grace, on the contrary, strives for mortification of self. I spoke to someone years ago who says, mortification is an old word. We don't use it anymore. Boasting! You need to be using it in your daily speech. Mortification. The dying thereof. Putting to death. We need to be speaking the language of mortification in the Christian realm. She, she, Grace, resists sensuality, seeks to be in subjection, longs to be conquered, has no wish to use her own liberty, loves to be held under discipline. Do you guys love the chastising of the Lord saying, thank you, Jesus, you saved my life, and does not desire to rule over anyone, but wishes rather to live, to stand, to be always under God for whose sake she's willing to bow humbly to every human creature. Nature works for its own interest. It looks to the prophet. It can reap from another. Grace does not consider what is useful and advantageous to herself, but rather what is profitable to many. Nature likes to receive honor and reverence. Grace faithfully attributes all honor and glory to God. Nature fears shame and contempt. Grace is happy to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. Nature loves ease and physical rest. Grace, however, cannot bear to be idle and embraces labor willingly. Nature seeks to possess what is rare and beautiful abhorring things that are cheap and coarse. Grace, on the contrary, delights in simple, humble things, not despising those that are rough, nor refusing to be clothed in old garments. Nature has regard for temporal wealth and rejoices in earthly gains. It is sad over a loss and irritated by a slight, injurious word. But grace looks to eternal things and does not cling to those which are temporal, but neither disturbed, being neither disturbed at loss nor angered by hard words. Because she has placed her treasure and joy in heaven where nothing is lost. Nature's covetous, receives more willingly than it gives, loves to have its own private possessions. Grace, however, is kind and open hearted. Grace shuns private interest, is contented with little, and judges it more blessed to give than to receive. Nature is inclined toward creatures, toward its own flesh, toward vanities, toward running about. But grace draws near to God and to virtue, renounces creatures, hates the desires of the flesh, restrains her wanderings, blushes at being seen in public. 
Nature likes to have some external comfort in which it can take sensual delight. But grace seeks consolation only in God. To find her delight in the highest good above all things. Nature does everything for its own gain and interest. It can do nothing without pay and hopes for its good deeds to receive their equal or better or else praise and favor. It is very desirous of having its deeds and gifts highly regarded. Grace, however, seeks nothing temporal, nor does she ask any recompense but God alone. Of temporal necessities, she asks no more than will serve to obtain eternity. Nature rejoices in many friends and kinsfolk, glories in noble position and birth, fawns on the powerful, flatters the rich, and applauds those who are like itself. Grace loves even her enemies, is not puffed up at having many friends. She does not think highly of either position or birth unless there is also virtue there. She favors the poor and preference to the rich. She sympathizes with the innocent rather than with the powerful. She rejoices with the true man rather than with the deceitful and is always exhorting the good to strive for better gifts, to become like the Son of God, practicing the virtues. Nature is quick to complain of need and trouble. Grace is stanch in suffering want. Nature turns all things back to itself. It fights and argues for self. Grace brings all things back to God, in whom they have their source. To herself, she scribes no good. She is neither arrogant or presumptuous. She is not contentious. She does not prefer her own opinion to the opinion of others, but in every matter of sense and thought, submits herself to eternal wisdom and the divine judgment. Nature has a relish for knowing secrets, hearing news. Oh, did you hear that? What, such and such. It wishes to appear abroad and to have many sense experiences. It wishes to be known and to do things for which it would be praised and admired. But Grace does not care to hear news or curious matters. Because all this arises from the old corruption of man, since there is nothing new, nothing lasting on earth. Grace teaches, therefore restraint of the senses avoidance of self, vain self-satisfaction and show the humble hiding of deeds worthy of praise and admiration and the seeking in everything and in every knowledge the fruit of usefulness, the praise and honor of God. She will not have herself or hers exalted, but desires that God who bestows all simply out of love should be blessed in his gifts. This grace is a supernatural light, a certain special gift of God, the proper mark of the elect, and the pledge of everlasting salvation. It raises man up from earthly things to love the things of heaven. It makes a spiritual man out of a carnal one. The more than nature is held in check and conquered, the more grace is given. Every day the interior man is reformed by the new visitations according to the image of God. Guys, we have to deny ourselves and imitate Christ through bearing the cross so, are you ready for the coming of Jesus? Can you go before him and say, Jesus, please show me who you are. I want to look like you in your glory. In, and you're not ready for that until you are ready to look like him in your humiliation. Not humility, humiliation. Christ on the cross, naked, exposed, moth beaten, jeered left alone after he just was whipped to death. You guys want to receive slander for the cause of Christ to suffer as a Christian. If you're not, get before him and say, Jesus, I confess I'm not ready for this. I signed up for you. I gave my life to you. I'm sorry. I confess that you didn't count the cost and that's okay. Because we are, we fall short. There's no righteous, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But when you confess your sin, First John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Plead the blood of Jesus. Jesus, I didn't know what I signed up for. I'm sorry. I didn't know this is what it costs. Guys, make a commitment now I to say, Lord, from today, I want to live for you 100% of the time. I don't want to live on borrowed years or years of the past when you showed up or when all these great workings of God happened and I did all this wonderful mission work or 
I, I, I did all this preaching or sharing. It could have been 20 years past. Guys, don't do that. Don't do that. His mercy is new every morning. Every morning. That's what my Bible says. You guys should wake up. First words out of your mouth, thank you, Jesus, for the sleep. I get to pre I get to share of your goodness in the land of the living one more day. Every day should be a miracle. Every day there should be miracles. Big things, little things. God, thank you. You found my keys when I cried out to you. God, I hurt yesterday and I feel good this morning. Do you not understand that hell is, uh, is everything where it's not? You don't have sunshine? You don't have light? You don't have the beauty of snow untouched? Uh, birds chirping? Music? You don't have that. You have weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. You have people that are in, 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 in sulfur and in acid in, in, in things that are beyond any human comp ability to smell and just fire. And those are people who we love. And they're there. God, why didn't you tell? Now, people make their decisions. I'm not saying that. But that should urge us to say, don't go there. Share the love of Jesus. Whether it be in your life, saying, I, I am forgiven. I am a sinner saved by Jesus. I am loved. I am blessed. Blessed because it costs him everything. That's why. Because every drop of Jesus' blood. Only one drop just healed me for 20 years. Our hearts have got to have that thanksgiving. Jesus, help me hate my sin. May I feel the weight of my sin. That I may appreciate you. And know how much I'm forgiven. Father, the end of the matter is this. Fear God. Do what he says. Preach the good news. Repent. He told the world, to, us to the world, preach the good news. To the church, he said, repent. You're not high. You're not mighty. But Lord, you are high. You are mighty. We are dust. Jesus, you have given us a great love. You've broken us so you may pour your grace greater. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace greater than our sin. Be Thank you, Father. You've given us a heritage that causes us to stand before the mighty throne of God. To the homosexual, I, I, I'm, I'm just being hit with this word. Listen. There's a homosexual that's hearing me now. That is not your identity. You came from the church. You got burned from the church. I'm sorry. It was not God's fault. Sinful man that didn't do it right. And I ask for your forgiveness for what they've done. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. Please turn. This is not a message of hate. This is a message of love. He loves you. He knows of your struggle. He knows of your pain and your hurt. He died for you. He wants you to give your life to him. He'll take care of you and he'll heal you. Jesus, you are so ready to forgive. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Forgive us, O oh God. Thank you for your blessed Savior. The Lord Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.